Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. And uh, it's uh, great to see everybody logging in. Uh, this week on Virtual Global Spine, I have the uh, honor of being the host, and I'm sure others will join us. Um, and I thought today uh, we would just talk about something very practical. Uh, and I'm really interested in hearing and um, learning from others, you know, around the country and also around the world, what their practices are, and especially if they have any protocols for infections in the spine. And I think wherever you are, whatever type of practice you do, whether it's MIS, open, degen, deformity, oncology, uh, I think we all can agree that infections are, uh, are terrible and they often really drive each and every one of us pretty crazy. So with that being said, I don't really have a talk. I'm just going to show a couple slides and, uh, and also show you a little bit about what I do now in specific situations and maybe share some of our protocols here uh, in Boston at the MGH. And um, happy to take any questions. And again, um, you know, really want to hear and learn from others today. So uh, that being said, I know Alex is also online and he also has a, a case uh, he will also like to show and discuss. And so uh, let's get started. Okay. Um, maybe Alex, you can help me out here. Are you seeing the slide or are you seeing the presenter view? Yeah, I see the presenter view. Okay. How about that? Yeah, much better. Okay, good. Hey, Wendy, it's good to see you. Um, I don't have a lot of radiographs or pictures, so I apologize, but um, but I'll, I'll do my best to uh, uh, keep everyone engaged here. So, uh, so let's get started. So we're gonna show some cases, talk about infections, antibiotics, avoidance strategies, and how to manage. So, you know, when we talk about spinal infections, uh, we all deal with them. And most commonly thoracic lumbar spine. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone here. Uh, some clear risk factors, right? I don't care where you are in the world. I think that, you know, if your body mass index is high, if you're operating on smokers and those patients have other significant medical comorbidities, you're gonna be at a higher infection risk. But the question is, what can you do to prevent that before it happens? And does it make a difference, okay? And we know that there are a lot of different routes, uh, transmission pathways for uh, infection, and most of these tend to be staph aureus. Now, when we think about degen, deformity, tumor, I'm a little biased because yes, I, I, I do a lot of tumor work, but also in this patient population, they're very frail. And we've talked about frailty a lot in this, uh, on this platform, as well as others, and how we characterize frailty. But now you're seeing a lot of that across subspecialties in spine surgery. And I think if you pick up any journal now, you're going to see a lot of work on people using frailty to determine whether they should do MIS, open or endoscopic surgeries. You know, people are using frailty to consider whether to do a T10 to pelvis open or, you know, hybrid mini open MIS. Uh, so I think, you know, we're, we're hearing about this a lot. And I think especially it's very relevant to infections and uh, dehiscence uh, and wound disruption, especially when instrumentation is involved. And so I just put this up there as just sort of a graphic uh, to center our framework, thinking about frailty, especially when you think about, let's say in the tumor world where patients have had radiation, they have chronic comorbidities, including age uh, and things like diabetes and hypertension, but also in an immunocompromised state, 
where they're just dealing with inflammation and cancer. That's also an issue. Also, this concept of sarcopenia, their body composition is also very important. And then malnutrition, right? I think for most surgeons, we, we look at patients and we think of nutrition just by looking at them, looking at their BMI. But, you know, you don't really know what kind of diets people have and really what their level of um, nutrition is. And then you have the stress of surgery, right? The acute stress of surgery and how that plays into um, their infection risk. And this is important because, you know, sometimes patients are on, you know, immune regulating uh, medications. Some patients are on chronic steroids. Patients with bad rheumatoid arthritis may be on, you know, steroids or other type of medications that have an implication on healing. So um, those are all things we need to be think thinking about. So here are some pictures, and I think this is uh, something that, um, you know, everyone is familiar with. And this is a patient of mine who had a disruption after a multi-level lumbar operation. And you can see here, focal disruption of the wound, some areas have healed well, you know, and you see this patient in the office and, you know, I don't know how many would really try to manage this as an outpatient with wound care, nursing and optimization. Uh, just by even exploring this in the office, uh, you know, we try to clean around the edges, poke around, see what's going on. But, you know, deep down inside, I, I think it's pretty obvious that this probably won't heal with secondary intention or even with wound vacuuming because the tissue looks somewhat necrotic uh, and fibrous. Uh, and at the time of surgery, you open it up and this is what you see, right? So open it up, you find the hardware, you know, whether or not the hardware is open to air or not. Um, you know, I'm just curious, uh, Alex, in, in your experience, are you, are you removing hardware often, let's say in the early post-operative period, or are you allowing for maximal medical debridement, surgical therapies before even considering that? Yeah, hello, John. This is a um, um, very important question. And I think um, it's pretty clear that we have an advice that if the implants are um, solid in the bone, if they're not loose, if they are really good in uh, the, the tissue, in the bony tissue, uh, we should aim to retent the implants in situ, not to remove them. It's the opposite if they are loose and um, you can, uh, if you uh, put force on the implant construct and, and you see it's loose, then it's better to remove them or um, to renew the uh, construct. Um, but um, my primary aim in the early six weeks is implant retention do not remove them because you put you have put them in for a good reason because after tumor resection it would be an instable spine without uh, this construct and um, we we put them on antibiotics um, and when the skin is closed and the skin is the wound is dry we put them on rifampicin mostly if the if the bug is um, uh, can be treated with this um, for um, Staphylococcus aureus. If it's um, if it's our most common uh, bug here, and then we put them on uh, rifampicin. It's very biofilm active. We had a lot of discussion on Twitter in the last week. Um, it is maybe more common in Europe than in the US, um, but this is our protocol and it works really fine. When the infection occurs, like, like three months later, more than six weeks, it's uh, very likely we cannot um, return the implants in situ and then we have to exchange them. Okay, now what do you, now what do, you do about the bone graft though? You know, because I've struggled with it. Let's say you've done a L3 to five T lift or open decompression infusion, whether you use BMP or bone chips or iliac crust, you know, we do the debridement, we find the hardware, let's say the hardware feels fine, it's just a recent operation. You know, something I've struggled with is, you know, we have this dogma within spine surgery that, oh, infections, they, they heal the bone and everything fuses great, right? But, you know, I've been in a lot of cases where you open it and you just put all this fresh, you know, we spend a lot of time to prepare the bone and get it right and pack it in all the right places, decorticate things. 
but then when you have purulent fluid kind of all in there, um, you know, are you like aggressively taking that out and redoing the arthrodesis or just sort of washing it and letting it be? I don't know the answer, so that's why I'm asking. I'm just curious yeah. what we'll do. This is this is the main reason why we all hate infections. Um, this is we do so much effort and we do so much work in the primary surgery, and then these um, bacteria come and um, they ruin everything you do. Doing. So I think it, you, you will do an evolution in your practice. First, you will think, oh, I will leave the, uh, the graft in situ and I want to preserve this because I want to have a fusion. And then later, when you see it's not working, you are going to remove this, um, this graft, make a, a, a more aggressive debridement. And then um, when you get all these pseudos uh, after infection, you think again, maybe I leave it. So I, I don't know the answer as well. But um, for me, and I teach my residents um, that debridement, uh, a radical debridement of the soft tissue and the graft um, leads to um, to a better heal of the infection. Great. Now, I, I have a question for Wendy, and uh, this this may be a little unfair because I don't actually have an image for you to comment on, but uh, I think just from your perspective, you know, something that I've, and other surgeons may feel the same way, but typically I, I'm, I'm really reluctant to get MRI imaging pretty acutely after surgery, especially with contrast, because it seems like everything just enhances. And it's, um, and part of it is now that patients have access to all their uh, radiology reports, at least in our institution, you know, and it says that there's a suspicion for infection. It just, it really triggers a lot of emotions for a lot of people, including the surgeons. So the question I have is, you know, and I wish I had a, 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 an image here for you to comment on, but, you know, just in general, are there any key distinguishing characteristics that would, let's say, distinguish typical post-operative change or enhancement versus like a true, true, let's say, post-operative infection that from, from your perspective? You know, that's what I was taught in my training was that never get an MRI before six weeks or at least four. And it seems like I didn't used to see those as much that where, where I am now, um, sometimes they're getting them a little bit earlier. I guess they're symptomatic. It's a little bit harder for me to see the patient histories now, but um, it's too hard to tell. It, you really can't tell even, you know, whether right. infection from non-infection maybe is a little bit easier, you know, whether there's still dish there or something, it's really hard. But yeah, I think after six weeks, you know, there's some certain things you can look for, like the thin linear enhancement along the end plates, if you're looking up L-spine, microdisc, something, um, recurrent residual disc with enhancement. But before that time, though, I, I, I think it is hard to tell. I think you have to go so much on clinical symptoms. Um, I think maybe the only thing that might be a clue would be paraspinous. Hmm. You know, something looks like phlegmon or abscess, paraspinous, prevertebral. I don't know about epidural, but um, that might be something you wouldn't typically have that's just post-op. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Off the top too. Of my head, that's all I can think of. Yeah, no, I I think that's great. I mean, just for from from my standpoint, I look at the paraspinal muscles and I'm trying to see is there something really obvious there? Because yeah, it's even though there's a, a big surgical dead space a lot of times with these open operations, at least. Um, I'm admittedly not really an MIS surgeon. So at least with the open operations, um, there's a dead space. So you expect there to be some fluid, you know. So I think that's why it's always a little hard to interpret. Um but uh, here I'll show you my next slide is, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is, these are carbon fiber implants. And now um, I've shown cases in other settings of how we use carbon fiber in oncology. And this is one of uh, two vendors and two companies that we have access to here now. And uh, many people ask, well, does, does this material get infected? And I will say, yes, it doesn't get, get infected. Uh, and, um, uh, the companies don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. Um, it gets infected. And, and this honestly was one of the worst cases I have had in the last year where everything was just yellow, brown, and not uh, vascularized at all. Um, and nothing really was adherent to the, uh, the implant itself, 
but uh, and maybe it was just that this patient had radiation and had cancer. Um, so again, not very scientific, but just anecdotally, um, this was one of the first cases that I had of carbon fiber implants uh, that uh, we saw in infection. And I think this is important because, you know, we've always thought of stainless steel and titanium and how some metals are, you know, more or less inclined to um, getting infected. But I, I think it's pretty much the biology of infection that anything in that environment can and will get uh, infected. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about prevention. So I think if you look at the literature, if you search this, and many of you may have done this already at your own institutions or practices looking for guidelines or ideas, uh, you'll find a number of different um, protocols. And I, I picked two here just because um, uh, they're pretty pretty common, I think, in terms of what we do. And they often uh, include some type of preoperative bath uh, using Hibiclens uh, solution, uh, as well as now nasal screening for Staph aureus. Um, we do that as well. At the end of my slides, I'm actually going to show our actual inpatient and outpatient protocol. So if anyone is interested, you could take a screenshot and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it up there because it's not, uh, it's, you know, it's anyone's welcome to it, but it shows our actual workflow that, you know, some may, may feel helpful and want to modify for their own specific center. Uh, but we do the nasal screening for staph aureus. And if it's positive, we preoperatively treat with 2% 2, 2%, uh, mupirocin ointment that the, the patients just basically administer before surgery. And now at our institution, we're doing this only for instrumented cases. So if you're having something put in from laminoplasty plates to iliac screws, um, you're gonna be part of this protocol. If it's just decompression alone, we're, we're not doing it at that time for that. Um, and at the time of surgery, it's just antibiotics, you know, uh, which is pretty typical before incision as well as a standard uh, prep. And I think that you'll see this at a number of centers. And here I mentioned Pittsburgh and Cleveland Clinic, and you can see how, you know, various centers have looked at it from different points of view, whether it's um, cost savings or decrease in infection risk. And I think that the Pittsburgh uh, experience is pretty remarkable in that they decrease their infection rate by 45%. So um, pretty significant overall. Um, Alex, do you have a specific protocol at your uh, your institution? Yeah, we have the same. Um, I, I would just to mention on your protocol, you say screening for Staphylococcus aureus. Um, we started with screening for a uh, MRSA for methylene resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and then we changed to um, Staphylococcus aureus in general. Um, and this is, um, do you have a problem with uh, uh, MRSI um, in, in your hospital as well? Or um, are you now on a, on a better um, situation like um, I say 15 years ago? Uh, I mean, I think we still have issues with MRSA. It's, it's, it's still a problem, you know? Yeah. So. In, in Europe, we have got a, really, it's a national problem. This is very interesting because in Switzerland, um, MRSA is no problem. But if you cross the border to other countries, we have got some like 30 to 50% um, of MRSA um, in the asymptomatic um, population. It's like a colonization on the on the skin, yeah. and so um, and now we we um, just um, neglect the the presence of MRSA and we just screen. And this chlorhexidine um, bathing we do as well. We have got some issues with uh, conjunctivitis uh, from the um, irritation of the eyes and of uh, any mucosa because patients are not really. Um, you have to instruct them very well. Um, otherwise, they don't do it. They do it once, and then they don't do it this, the, the, the another day. Uh, but I think we we need these um, protocols in every hospital when you have got a problem with infections. Yeah, and I think part of the the, the trouble too is that even if you follow a protocol, there's still a lot of variation, especially with surgeon practice. For example. Uh, I'm going to mention vancomycin powder in just a second, but even the use of vancomycin powder, right? Um, you know, some surgeons will use it, some won't. 
some meta-analyses show that, you know, it's helpful. Some studies will say it's not helpful. It's really how you interpret the data and, you know, what, what's, what, what works and everyone has their own bias. And so I'm really curious, you know, maybe people can write in the chat, you know, um, you know, what, what people's thoughts are on Vink powder, you know, maybe yes or no, do, do people use that? Um, I myself, I use it um, in instrumented cases, uh, any instrumented case. But what I do is, um, and again, this is not scientific, this is all anecdotal. So uh, what I do is I, I take the gram of vancomycin powder and what I do is I mix, I make a slurry out of it, you know, just like you have flow seal and um, gel foam. So I, I don't like vancomycin powder just as it is, because as you know, as, as soon as it hits something wet, it starts to get clumpy, you know? So what I do is, uh, and it's kind of like, you know, I grew up in Chicago, so it's kind of like Michael Jordan before every game, he takes chalk and he just throws it up into the air and you see this poof of uh, a chalk, you know? And so, and so for us, it's like, that's what my resident does. They do this and it just gets everywhere and I don't think it's really doing anything. So what I do is I take that gram of vancomycin powder, we mix it up with 20 cc's of saline, get it into like a nice sort of gelatinous glaze, put it in a syringe, and I just basically spray it on superficial and deep. So it kind of gives us nice, even coating. Uh, I can't tell you that it's more effective than the powder. Um, but, uh, but at least for me, I, I found that it gives a little more consistent uh, application to that. Uh, and so I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat saying that they do use Vank powder. Um, yeah, so uh, you always use subfascial washing and Vank powder. Um, great. So, um, but it seems like that, despite the data, what's out there, it uh, seems like that is pretty common practice. Uh, Anna Terry saying that she uses Vank powder for high risk open fusions. Um, great. Okay. So, you know, I think that, you know, it's just like robotics, right? Every, every month you pick up a journal, you're going to see a meta analysis on robotics. Uh, and I'm guilty of that because we wrote one too. And then, you know, next month, someone, someone writes one and it's the same thing on bank powder. So I have a hard time keeping up with that topic, honestly. Um, and I never, you know, claim or pretend like I have all the answers, but, um, and so let's talk about that. So this is one of the more recent um, reviews that I know of um, looking at almost 12,000 spine surgery patients. Um, who did not receive ink powder versus 8,000 who did. And um, you see what the difference is here. So in this meta-analysis, Vank powder significantly reduced the relative risk of developing an infection. And you can see the relative risk with the confidence, confidence interval here, okay? Um, and so I think ultimately what most people will agree on is that it's less clear if this really if it increases the risk of gram negative infection, right? Um, and uh, Mike Galgano is saying that he's never seen it hurt anyone. Mike, please feel free to um, chime in if you wanna say something, but um, I agree, I've never seen it really become an issue. Um, but then again, I haven't specifically personally studied this myself. So I, I'm just telling you from anecdotal experience from a high volume uh, tertiary sort of, um, uh, center myself, but agreed. I think this conclusion here is that further studies are required to investigate whether rates of infection are affected using vank powder, especially for gram negative pathogens. What about other, other type of antibiotics, um, other delivery systems, antibiotic impregnated beads um, or implantables? Um, you know, there is bone cement that you can use with tobramycin, uh, vancomycin. Um, our plastic surgeons use this quite extensively, um, especially with uh, really tough recurrent issues of dehiscence with instrumented hardware. Um, I'm curious, does anyone here use uh, antibiotic impregnated beads or pellets of any kind in their cases, whether routinely or in salvage? Uh, so John, we 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 stop this. Uh, we have seen no no benefit, um, and um, so we stopped it. We we have no. Uh, again, this is not. It's um, evidence here, anecdotal from from Switzerland, but we don't use 
any of these pellets um, here. Okay. Yeah, I've never used it as well either, John. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the only time when I've used it is with really tough uh, revision cases uh, where we have plastic surgery and they bring out all these different tools. And I'm going to show you guys one of them, which I was really blown away by. And, and now I'm a big fan. And, you know, I don't, I don't, they don't have anything related to this from a conflict wise, but I'm going to show you something that uh, has really been a game changer in terms of managing um, active infections. And I'm going to show you guys that in, in, in a couple of slides. Oh, here we go. So here we go. So this is a case I recently did. Uh, this was for a large cervical thoracic primary tumor, uh, something like C2 to T10 instrumentation, multiple rods, all of that. The, the, the issue, the, the focus is not on, you know, the glorious spectacle of what we did with surgery and, you know, the pre-op and post-op and all of that. I really want to emphasize the infection. So, um, Pro just made skin incision, and you can see coming through the fat there. That's the upper thoracic spine. Um, and, and at the skin level, nothing was coming through. It was just a focal dehiscence. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to open up a little bit. We'll put in a swab, feel around, and see what comes out. And then it just kept pouring and pouring and pouring, right? And so this is clear, and this is within one month uh, of surgery. So, and, and it's tough, right? Because we've done this major reconstruction, staged operation, resecting a tumor, multiple teams doing this, um, great oncologic results, numerous rods, but then this happens within a month, this patient comes back febrile and, have to undo the plastics closure that was done before, undo the bone graft and the vascularized graft. So it's not trivial. And so once we wash that out, this is, you know, what we see. And this is uh, courtesy of, uh, you know, 4K iPhone 13, whatever, you know, I think it really shows just what that looks like. And this is uh, our plastics teams kind of like elevating that paraspinous flap that they had done, done before. And you can see how um, this tissue just does not look healthy, right? And we haven't even exposed the hardware yet. And this is just another example of that. So you can see just how wide our initial exposure and dissection was, um, you know, to take out a tumor like this. But this is similar to if you're doing a deformity operation, wide retraction, dissecting past the ribs. Um, and you can see the spinous processes here. But you can see how like just within a month, you can see that it's just encased by this really um, ill appearing tissue, okay? And so you can see we, we started superficially and the same thing, you know, we're constantly in denial. It's like, is this really infected? Well, come on, it just, of course it's infected. Or should we open the fascia? Of course we should open fascia because, you know, we're just kind of hoping that it's not swimming around or bathing the instrumentation, but uh, in this case, it clearly was. Uh, and here, this is a, another technique that um, I learned from our plastic surgeons using the, the Bovi <laughs> scratch pads. Um, uh, to, so we've had hardware, cervicals to the right, bottom part of the construct, you can see the, the multiple rods there. Um, so using that to debride all that tissue away, um, again, you want to be rough, but not too rough. You don't want to disrupt uh, potential sources where that, that blood flow is going to help uh, the skin. And so this is what I wanted to mention. So our plastic surgeons, you know, when I work with us, uh, a great group of plastic surgeons for these cases um, across all different types. So revision surgeries, deformity surgeries, oncologic cases, primary tumors, metastases, I get plastic surgeons involved up front most of the time. So uh, that may be extreme, but even let's say if a patient's had, let's say two lumbar surgeries done before, like let's say someone had a L3 to S1 decompression somewhere, then they had a L3 to S1 
fusion, and then now they have PJK or adjacent level stenosis, and I'm doing the operation, I have plastic surgeons there closing for me. I don't, I don't do that on my own. Um, so my threshold to have plastic surgeons there at the time of when I'm operating, my threshold is actually very low. Um, for DGEN, now for deformity, it's, I, um, I have them there almost all the time. Uh, and, you know, in the last year, when we had one of these, oh my goodness, you know, hey, are you available today? I've got to add this washout. Uh, this, and they're always, yeah, happy to come and they're, they're there day and night. And one day I, I saw, you know, the, the plastics fellow and the chief resident just take this blue solution out of this, out of their bag. And then I was just like, what in the world is this? You know, it's like, oh, this is the, this is the special sauce, you know, and I had never seen it before. I don't know. Alex, Mike, have you guys seen this before? I've never seen it before, no. Okay. All right. See, so you're learning something. Isn't that great? So everyone's learning something. Okay. So ask you a quick um, question, John. What's that? I just want to ask you a quick question. So, John, what do you do at your bone graft in these cases? Um, you know, if you have a superficial wound dehiscence, you know, um, and there's some pus, do you still open up the fascia and swap out the bone graft? Or is that something routine you do? I feel like I'm always in a conundrum. And I always worry that the bone graft is just kind of, you know, floating around this, you know, sloppy, infectious material. So a lot of times I'll just take it out and, and regraft. But I'm curious what you do. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's funny, because I asked Alex that exact same question, like in the first five minutes, you know, and, uh, and some other people had uh, um, some, uh, some others I actually waited in the chat as well. I I'm with you. I, you know, in the first month, you know, we spend all this time, I remember when I was a resident, and granted, as a neurosurgeon, maybe that's just what at that time, and I'm not that old, but maybe at that time, that's what made neurosurgeons different from orthopedists, was when we arthrodes, we just sprinkled like bone on stuff and just, you know, put the DBX in there and we're like, okay, let's close. But when I was a fellow working with the orthopedists, I mean, we decorticated, we grafted, we, it was so meticulous in terms of how we put bone graft down. And I was just like, wait a second, we usually just sprinkle the stuff on and get out, get out of here. But no, so to your point, Mike, um, yeah, so I'm always torn and I don't have a specific algorithm. And because I think one, someone mentioned in the chat, because the bone graft is not vascularized, right? It's just onlay. It's not, you know, nothing is press fit. There's no real mechanical stress on that it's pretty, it's inert. And a lot of times, you know, the stuff resorbs and dissolves anyway. I mean, if it's at, if it's obviously infected where there's pus around it, I just take a cob or curette and I, I, I ended up, I end up debriding most of it out um, because oftentimes I feel just like washing it won't do anything. Um, but if it's superficial and primarily above the fascia and subfascially, it doesn't really look infected. I, I won't do that. Um, but to be fair, I swab everything just because I've been in cases where we'll swab the superficial tissue because that's clearly where it dehisced and it looked like a superficial dehiscence. Uh, and then, you know, I'll open the fascia a little bit, looks okay, look at the hardware, everything looks fine, and I'll swab underneath the fascia. And then it comes back to be positive as well. And the infectious disease doctors and give me a really hard time about how come I didn't wash out the subfascial space, you know? Um, so I swab everything anyway, but unless it's clearly infected, I'll just leave it. So. How about using a prophylactic skin vac? That's something that I've been doing a lot for cervical, cervical, uh, cervical thoracic cases, even some of the big lumbar tumors and deformities. Uh, I, I don't know if there's different ones on the market, but the one I use is called Prevena. Have you had any interest to, or experience in that? Yeah, doing the same thing. Doing the same thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, that's usually... Um, you know, the, the plastic surgeons, they usually take that out and they're, they're using that, you know, in combination with uh, their closure. Um, but uh, we are using that increasingly more versus trying to always get primary closure the first time. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested in a year what your thoughts are, you know, and how that, um, you know, how that turned out for you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I want to talk about this, uh, the solution called Vosh. And um, interestingly enough, 
it is uh, this solution made of hypochloric hypochlorous acid. And I had to look this up because I was never really good at chemistry and I still am not. And so I really had to look into this and read about this. And, and apparently it's great because it kills just about any type of bacteria pretty quickly. Uh, and granted, this is taken from their website, but I did look around and it seems pretty consistent that this um, agent is is pretty lethal and effective in obliterating all different types of um, a bacteria, as you can see here. Um, but this not to be confused with um, Sky Vodka, right? So I, I know this is something Alex knows very well, you know, so just, just got to be very careful here. Um, but why does it matter? Well, because pH matters. And, you know, I talk to, you know, the plastic surgeons, the nutritionists, you know, people who really know things about wound management, you know, uh, the, the wound care nursing. And, you know, this is something that it's not really, you know, in my headspace or, you know, knowledge base thinking about the pH content of the different irrigants and things that we're using. Um, but I learned a lot thinking about this and using the solution because it's, you know, not, it, it's pretty neutral. So it's not going to disrupt normal regulation of tissue healing factors. Um, but it also reduces the toxicity of bacteria and the bacterial end products. Uh, and so I think that the key, what I've learned from our plastic surgeons is that the key is that it's impact on angiogenesis. And that is something that it does differentiate it from other agents. And I'm gonna show you a video of kind of what that looks like. And so this solution, it's pretty clear and it's a little disconcerting because it actually is so clear. It looks like CSF, okay? And, but once it goes in and it hits the infected tissue, it turns almost black, dark gray. Uh, and it's 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 pretty it's pretty phenomenal. So you can so it comes in pretty clear. So it sort of smells like bleach, but you can see it takes on this really dark gray sort of appearance. Uh, and we use the whole bottle sort of uh, wash around it. And in this case, you can see I, the bone graft, we pretty much took it all out um, and had to, had to redo it. So let's talk about so that's a little bit about how now I'm approaching these tough situations versus just dumping hydrogen peroxide and beta you know, beta dine in there. You know, we're using this solution now and and now keeping record of that and studying that and um, tracking that so we can share some of that experience, hopefully, in something a little more scientific than just a couple uh, glorious videos here. Um, but what about standardization of periop care? Like we've talked about the Hibiclens, you know, the swabbing, all of that and optimization of the frailty, right? So maybe you tell your patient, stop smoking, stop drinking so much, you know, see a nutritionist. But, you know, th those are actually not really modifiable. We say that they are, but it's very hard. It's very difficult for people to change, right? It's like, it's, it's very difficult. Even if you tell someone you need to increase your muscle mass, uh, it's not so easy. Even taking protein shakes every day. I don't, you know, even for elite athletes, it's difficult to take, it's difficult to do that. And so we think that we focus on what we can do from a system standpoint, uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis, and again, within surgical techniques, just showed a number of these different things, right? So pre, intra, and post, and this was something published in uh, uh, Spine Journal, uh, I think, last year. That um, I recommend. It's 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 a good overview primer with a lot of great tables and graphics. Um, if you want to um, 
uh, dive a little deeper into that. Uh, let's see, just before I move on, there's a comment. Do you use diluted betadine or hydrogen peroxide wound wash? You know, I used to use hydrogen peroxide a lot for um, irrigating wounds in the uh, post-operative infection setting, but I don't anymore now that we have this agent. And uh, I I've been told that hydrogen peroxide is a little too toxic to the tissue, so I don't do that at this time. Uh, so back to this table, uh, looking at a summary of recommended interventions. So there's a lot of data here, but again, uh, thinking about antimicrobial prophylaxis, um, you know, coming up with some type of systems oriented approach at your institution uh, can be helpful. Uh, and so I think that the more that we think about this, I think we can start to make gradual changes that will help our patients. And again, uh, I have one case to show you after these two slides, but again, this is the, this is our protocol at Mass General uh, for our uh, infection screening. Uh, and this is for outpatient, you know, so I think if this is helpful to anyone, you know, please feel free to take a picture, a screenshot, or I I'm happy to give you the slides. Um, and like any, like any flow chart there, you know, yes, no, yes, no, but it's actually pretty intuitive and pretty simple, but, you know, yeah, we started this, we rolled this out first as an outpatient, um, and whatever clinic workflow you have, whether it's with a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, medical assistant, secretary assistant, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, and it's just getting the swabs, checking the swab results, and then starting that patient on some type of um, mupirocin therapy before surgery. Okay. And we document that, that in the chart too. And so this is a major quality initiative. Uh, at our institution with regards to infection protocols. And then once we established that, then we, we did the same for inpatient. And now you can imagine how inpatient may be a little more tricky because, you know, in the chaotic environment of inpatient service of a major, major center like the MGH where patients are getting transferred in, their emergency patients, consultations from oncology, medicine, infectious disease, cardiology patients. I mean, it's, there are patients everywhere, right? And I think that speaks, it's not just for, for me here, but anyone who's in a busy practice setting, whether it's your community hospital, you're going to see this, you get consulted. And part of the problem is that if you have urgent, relatively emergent cases or cases you're going to the OR the next day, how do you mobilize and get these patients swabbed and get them started? Um, so we we do our best. We try to swab those patients, those consults as immediate as as soon as they come in, and we get them started. Um, but then again, it, it's tougher, right? Because patients who are in the hospital, they're going to be sicker, especially patients who are already on an inpatient medical service, uh, maybe who have been already admitted for several days or other factors that we can't control. So this is something that we just rolled out. Um, and uh, don't have data to show you yet, but I think it just gives you an overview of how, uh, even despite the anticipated um, sort of chaos of being at a busy center, there are ways to try to streamline operations uh, for this purpose. And so I think the last case, the last, uh, I'll just wrap up with showing a case, not so much of an infection, but um, a late dehiscence. Uh, involving instrumentation to show you just how difficult these situations can be. And we talked before about removing bone graft and when to remove instrumentation. And I think we can all think of situations we've been in where we've been faced with that early versus late. And I'm going to show you um, a case that I don't have the answers for, but, um, you know, maybe others will. And so, um, be great to get people's feedback before Alex's case. So here's a case of a patient who had uh, lung cancer. And um, this is actually a patient for whom they discovered the EGFR molecular receptor here in Boston. So a very high profile historic case. This patient had thoracic surgery, resection of the tumor, chemo radiation to this right lung. And you can see that here, this is the chest wall reconstruction on the right side. Uh, and this is uh, the area that was operated on before. 
Now, over time, this patient developed what looked to be a recurrence in that area. And she had a number of CT imaging demonstrating and PET imaging demonstrating activity in that area along the chest wall, now involving the lateral wall of the vertebra and the um, costa transverse junction on that side in the area where she had the operation before. MRI imaging demonstrates this lesion here. It's upper thoracic spine, T3, T4 area. You can see um, this is, yeah, here I labeled it actually, T4. And um, I'm trying to see here. I'm, I'm having a hard time making this out. I don't know, Wendy, can you, um, is there anything you can, I know this is totally unfair. I know you- I was hoping that. you wouldn't call on me because I don't know what's going on here either. So your second two- <laughs> Images are, are post-contrast? Yeah, post-contrast. So it's not enhancing whatever that is, big fluid collection? I think so. Actually, you know what? I'm not even sure. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to say anything else either. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just get it wrong. Um, but my, my point being that it's, it's in a tricky area, at least I think surgically, upper thoracic spine. Um, I wanted to show the orientation to the, the T2 nerve root, which you can see there. Um, and, oh, sorry, this is, this is net with contrast. So, um, but you can kind of get a sense for where that is relative to the heart, the mediastinal structures. Um, and this person's having progressive pain issues and you know, after having what was considered a curative resection for the underlying cancer. And here, and it's difficult because she's already had an operation before. So the same thing, it's, so there, there's so much that looks like it's enhancing, right? I mean, you can see the left lung here, but I, I mean, I, I can't, when we had this case, I, I couldn't really tell what was going on here, you know, even with some of these structures in the mediastinum. Um, I don't know, Wendy, it seems like this would be like a radio. Yeah, it, nightmare, it's tough right? because you have, I mean, everything is kind of retracted. They did a, a little back to me here, partial yeah. back. So everything's being pulled over the airway and the esophagus and everything, it looks like. So it is kind of right. hard to figure out right. what's going on. But you have enhancement in the canal, right? That's the important Yeah, part. Yeah, there is, there, there is enhancement to the foramen and to the canal. Uh, you're right. And um, even more so, like, like this, okay? So... Um, Many of us will look at this and think, or maybe everyone except for Michael Galgano, because you know he's on a he's on a he's on a higher level, you know. But you know, we I don't look know at about this. That. What's that? I said I don't know about that. <laughs> so we look at this and we think, okay, like what are the oncologic goals? What are the what are the overall goals for this patient? And again, there's this chest wall reconstruction. Is this fluid? Is this long? Is this what is it? You know, who knows? Is this esophagus? I mean, I, I, I don't know. So I'm talking to my radiologist. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, well, first let's biopsy this, right? Is this lung cancer? Does she have cancer elsewhere? Long story short, there's nothing anywhere else. Okay. Nothing anywhere else. We biopsy it. It's osteosarcoma. I guess that's not a surprise. I was like, I put that in my first slide. So that was a rookie mistake. So it's osteosarcoma. Okay, so now it's osteosarcoma in a patient who has lung cancer, no other sites of disease, high grade epidural spinal cord compression, right? Uh, who's having pain. And so what do we do? And here's, here's some more images, right? I, I think you get the picture, it's ugly. Okay, it's ugly. Uh, so it's osteosarcoma. So, you know, at our center, I think you guys know this because I've talked about this a lot. Um, we're very proton and radiation heavy. This patient got preoperative protons because the thought is that if we can do a, a, an on block resection uh, and take this out in one piece uh, to maximize local control, we're going to hit this with protons before. So that's what we did. But you know what? She developed weakness and she came to the emergency room. Urgent decompression. Uh, and so this is pre-op, you can see here. Uh, and I, I took her to surgery just to do laminectomy. I didn't take any of the tumor out, um, laminectomy, and um, got the pressure off the spinal cord. But now six weeks later, you can see what happened here. She developed some kyphosis, right? Um, and this here is basically a film that I left around the dura. 
So I don't want to say I didn't take out any tumor. I, I cut out the portion of the epidural tumor that you saw enhancing there just to give space for the cord, okay? Kind of like a fake separation surgery. But six weeks, but thinking, let's finish, let her heal, and we'll do the real operation later. So we did the radiation. So then we we got her through that. She's fine. So we did a staged approach with uh, posterior first with instrumentation above and below T1 to T8 um, with osteotomies, rib resection, all of that. Um, and this is kind of a view of what that looked like. So you can see that we've I've, I've got a protective barrier around the cord, uh, taking down the ribs, extra pull dissection, working around, freeing everything up that I could uh, on both sides. Um, and uh, this is sort of what it looks like before we're going to close. Second stage, coming back on another day now from an anterior lateral approach. Uh, you know, mobilizing the scapula for the upper thoracic spine, uh, really mobilizing that with the shoulder to get access um, uh, from the really high up in the thoracic spine to be able to reconstruct that and taking out, taking that out on block. And you can see the thoracic vertebra here with the chest wall reconstruction mesh that was done before, along with the tumor that's there. Uh, we put a P32 radiation plaque on the fecal sac there. This is the vertebrectomy defect that you can see, uh, followed with expandable cage uh, and um, uh, some bone graft here. And this is before we started using vascularized fibular grafts, but you can see the, the fecal sac as well as the rod on that side. And post-op, this is post-op CT. Uh, you can see kind of the, the corpectomy cage that was there, good end plate purchase there. Uh, maybe didn't get all of that top level of that vertebra. Hard to see, I admit, maybe not, doesn't look perfect, but it's pretty good overall. Uh, and you can see the sort of what that looks like there um, from our, our film. Now, three months later, she comes back with head drop and chin on chest. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of high fives because it was a great oncologic result. And, you know, going through that operation, it's, there's a lot going on there. But you can see here now that she's developed now a deformity. Right, so she had an oncologic problem. Now we turn this into a deformity, um, and she really couldn't get her head up. Now we can argue: is this really a fixed deformity versus flexible? You know what? It's fixed enough because she's miserable. And I did put her in traction in the hospital to see if she would get any um, any movement. But you can see here from the supine CT that um, there's definitely some correction. Right, so from the standing film you can see it's pretty dramatic but when she's lying down for the ct she's getting some correction of that in that in that position so that told me that you know what i don't think we need to do something as aggressive as like a three column osteotomy but we can do something where maybe with some releases uh traction multiple points of fixation we can do something and that's exactly what i did so i did this through a combined anterior posterior approach relying on uh, anterior uh, complete uncinate resections, uncinate osteotomies. And you can see here sort of what that looks like. You can see that that classic trapezius sign uh, that's there. You can see the healed incisions. Again, this is painful, right? We got this person to heal, to for the incisions to close, to get through the operation, and then this happens. So. I did this through a combined anterior posterior with traction, multi-level ACDF from the front down across the cervical thoracic junction, complete uncinate osteotomies from the front with the traction allows for a great reduction of that. I fixed that in the front with a plate and then in the back instrumented across from C2 and um, connected that to the bottom part. And, but the problem is we did all that again, but this is the most I could do with that. And so then same thing, call my plastic surgery friends who were already there for the first operation and said, hey, can you help me out? They already did the paraspinous flap and all of that. So they said, yeah, we can do that. Um, and again, mobilizing additional tissue, now mobilizing latissimus, getting all that together and you don't see any hardware and you can see from the distance from the skin to the muscle, I mean, to the fascia, that there's still pretty good integrity of the tissue there. 
And over five years, pretty good, right? I mean, I think that if my cervical deformity patients look like this at five years, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be at a different level, but I'm not. So this is this is where I am. But five years of this type of maintenance of correction, I was very happy with that. Um, and um, she's pretty neutral overall. And it's pretty happy from an oncologic standpoint, also doing very well. But like many things in spine surgery, you know, it's it's very humbling, right? And there's always something next. And so I didn't hear from her from a long time. And then the oncologist asks me, hey, you know, she's so grateful for everything you've done for her over, you know, almost more, more than five years. But, you know, there's an issue with the skin and this is what we see. And so um, there's hardware coming through the skin and you can see this is the cervical screw here and you see the prominence of the hardware in the back and they've tried you know obviously who would want to go through another operation right and she's already had the paraspinous flaps latissimus work and it's an ongoing challenge of hey what do we do here it's been swabbed numerous times but you know that if you swab this it's going to grow something right it's going to grow something so we treat it like an infection but you know, this person now is more frail, you know, um, cancer survivor, but frail. Nutrition may be not great. Um, and, and what do you do? As, as painful as this looks, not only for us, but as painful as it is for that patient to live through, um, it's a major issue. And this is a case where, yes, we all sort of know this is infected, but what can you live with? You know, what are your indications to take the hardware out? That was a discussion I had. I said, hey, you know, maybe it's far enough along where we can take the hardware out. But after an extensive oncologic and also deformity reconstruction, I don't know how many people would be willing to really take out the hardware because I'm not extremely confident that even though it's been like that for five years, that it's going to maintain that if I take everything out. Because despite the radiographic appearance of fusion, you know, I, I still feel that the instrumentation is doing something. So with that being said, this is the sort of the, the summary of that case. But I'll open it up. And sorry, Alex, I know I think I went a little long, so we don't have time for your case. But, um, you know, I promise you one day we'll get to your case. Um, but I, I'm just curious, you know, any closing thoughts, any other thoughts in the chat, um, you know, open to anything. So, John, I would not have taken out the hardware. Um, I'm curious what you ended up doing. I've had a few cases like that, too, where the hardware is literally completely coming out of the skin. But as beautiful as your reconstruction is, I don't completely trust it. Uh, the enter reconstruction without hardware in the back, whether or not the CAT scan shows that there's the quote-unquote arthrodesis. Yeah, I, honestly, I haven't done anything yet. It's it's still in limbo, you know. And um, as you as everyone knows, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm not one. I think we all love to show our great results, you know, and we all have our you know chest thumping moments. But you know, I think the reality is that, you know, uh, we learn from, uh, you know we learn from stepping stepping out and taking on challenging cases and i think you know showing you know things that give us problems uh, and being open to our vulnerabilities i think is really important uh, i think that's the way we grow and so i think you know for me i'm still figuring it out i don't i don't know what we're going to do for this person um, but we have other patients who are in different phases of similar trajectories, you know, where we're able to maximize the goals of maybe one or two critical goals of the operation, but then we're dealing with the, the collateral damage. So, but I agree, Mike, I mean, I don't, I don't take out the hardware because I've had cases where I did that once. I did that once after a lumbar PSO, I did a revision T10 to pelvis. It was like the patient's fifth operation. It was like three years out. I thought it fused and this patient just, just wanted desperately to do yoga and was like, oh, I can't, I can't move. And so I was like, okay, I'll take it out. And then um, the, the patient went back to being flat back. It was, it was crazy. 
even after showing robust fusion mass everywhere. So there's something else going on. So I do agree with you. I think there's some, I think the hardware does, and that's why hardware breaks, right? Hardware fractures, even in the context of having solid bone mass anterior and posterior, we know that happens. So there's something else that we haven't figured out, but, um, but yeah, I'll stop talking. Any other thoughts? Hey, John, that was a fantastic session, really. Yeah, I learned so much uh, about blue saws and, uh, and your um, protocols. Um, I, I just want to mention in acute uh, purulent infections, I think the treatment is um, uh, globally very, very similar. Uh, we treat them, I guess, um, really similar to, to the US and everywhere. But in, in, in chronic infections, in these low-grade infections, uh, the treatment um, is more like a, a tumor patient with very individualized therapy tailored to the, to the expectations of the patient. And um, when, when we see these uh, patients, we always have uh, severe uh, heart discussions with the infectious disease guys um, because they have their protocols and it's very easy to follow an algorithm like taking this out, but it doesn't work from the surgeon's view. Uh, and so I think these low grade chronic infections, um, it's, it's a, a discussion with the patient, with the surgeon, with the infectious disease. Um, and um, finally, um, I think there are international, um, globally seen um, some some differences. Um, and uh, in Europe, we we have got some other treatments, um, like in the US. Uh, and for me, um, uh, the only thing I would uh, love to mention is that um, go into disciplinary. Um, these um, these uh, patients can't be solved by a single surgeon. In, if you're a private practice and you have got an infection, um, I would just go for um, uh, an interdisciplinary treatment um, a plan. And I just want to uh, warn anybody to, to do this as a single surgeon with literature and antibiotics. No, I agree. I think that's, um, I think that's great closing thought. So, um, well, thanks everyone. Um, I honestly do not know what's on for next week, so I apologize, but if anyone does, <laughs> please speak up or you know what, just wait and find out. But, um, but thanks everyone. It's great to, to see everyone here, uh, on camera, off camera. So, um, Alex, Wendy, Mike, um, thanks for, uh, hanging out tonight and everyone. And, you know, as always, these are recorded and will be on the YouTube channel. So, um, and I would encourage anyone, please feel free to reach out anytime, whether it's on this or any other topic, I'm happy to discuss offline. All right. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, John. Take care. Take care.